welcome to the Writer's Dream. Our show is a show for authors to talk about how they write their books, how they publish their books, and how they market their books. You can find us on YouTube. You can find us on our Facebook page, which is called The Writer's Dream. And if you have a question for us or you would like to be on the show, please visit my website. Uh, it's just my name, lindamariafrank.com. And there is a tab to press where you can find out how to get on the show. Our guest today is Brian McLaughlin, and he has written a wonderful book about his personal experience. It's called A Flight Without Wings. Welcome, Brian. It's Hi, good Linda. to see you. Good to see you again. Now, tell us a little bit about your background, because I think it really feeds into the book. Uh, well, I'm an average, typical guy from Long Island. Spent most of my life here. Uh, married a high school friend. Uh, we travel throughout the world extensively, and uh, we seem to come back here to Long Island, uh, close to the ocean, which is Well, this is like the center of the universe. Come on, Brian. Well, that's what, <laughs> that's what we think. <laughs> and I think it's shared by a lot of people who have been here and have spent mm -hmm. their time here. So we keep coming back. and um, So... On one of your trips, was it one of your trips? Yeah, one of my trips is when I had a, you know, an accident. Uh, knowing about you, you're you're interested in fishing. Was it a fishing trip? No, it wasn't a fishing trip. But we, uh, my wife's family has a house uh, on the beach in Mexico. Uh huh. And uh, she also worked for the airlines, which <laughs> afforded us access to the world. So we spent a lot of time in Mexico. A lot of time. And uh, this was, the accident that I had was just a typical day, a typical visit, uh, you know, vacation, if you will. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was very typical. There wasn't anything special about it. Um, but what was the accident? Well, it's, uh, I, I don't know, blacked out, passed out, uh, whatever, and fell down a half a flight of stairs and landed my face on a concrete planter that was, you know, raised planter around a tree. Mm -hmm. And uh, severe, severe head trauma. Wow. You know, multiple skull fractures, it, all dislocated fractures all over my face. So it's, it's described in the book fairly well, maybe, maybe too well. <laughs> I don't know. Did they ever find out what caused you to black out? No. Wow. No. You know, we, we have theories. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't that I was uh, over drinking or anything like that. Um, well, we have some theories, and but still no proof. Mm -hmm. So we, we keep our theories to ourselves unless we can prove <laughs> it. So uh, it's just one of those things. So they took you to the hospital? Took me to the hospital. Oddly enough, they didn't have, you know, it's not like here in the States where you dial 911 and an ambulance comes from wherever you are. Mm -hmm. um, the waiter that was serving us at the table left and ran a dozen blocks in town to get the ambulance to come back. Oh my gosh. To, to uh, take us to, uh, well actually into Cancun. We were just, we were in Playa del Carmen which is about 40 minutes or so away. So you were we went in, to the hospital there and- uh, In Cancun. In Cancun. And uh, oddly enough, there was an ophthalmologist on, on duty in that hospital that night. And he, uh, he worked on putting my eye back together. Wow. Uh, but you were it unconscious. Just the beginning, it was just the beginning of the surgeries that I would need ultimately. Mm -hmm. They didn't have the equipment to, uh, to properly diagnose the extent of the injuries. But they guessed at it and uh, felt that I should be airlifted to the States. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what happened. So you were unconscious this whole time? I was unconscious most of the time. I didn't wake up until after surgery. In the States? I, I came in, no, he, uh, in, Mexico. in Mexico. I was brought in comatose. Uh, and I, I remember waking up after my experience that I write about in the book. Still After in seeing Mexico. my father, um, who had passed years earlier, uh, he, he sent me back. He said, you have to go back. 
And so, I was very disappointed. Yes. I so, was very disappointed. But I want you to take us step by step through what you experienced while you were comatose. Well, we uh, use the term. I'm comatose. assuming. I'm assuming that that's when I had my what I call near death experience. I used to call it a death experience. I, I knew nothing about them until until my own. Um, I describe it in the book as uh, typical of many stories that you hear, where you. I was aware of the doctors and nurses around me, could hear them, uh, could qu have quoted them, um, but I couldn't speak. I, I, I mean, I, I just couldn't speak. And um, that was a little bit disturbing. And I kept thinking to myself, listen, I can hear you, but I couldn't get it out. Mm -hmm. uh, then I sort of seemed to drift off to some some place where other people compare it to the, you know, bright light or the tunnel, mm -hmm. you know, it's similar to that. And um, where I ultimately met up with my deceased father. Uh, and he was the one who sent me back. He looked very different than he looked uh, the last time I had seen him. Uh, he, he died of cancer, so he was just a shell of a guy that he was. Mm -hmm. But when I saw him there, a vibrant, happy, pain-free, uh, and he didn't react to the way I looked either, which I didn't know at the time was, a, was quite a mess. So uh, that, was, that was satisfying. But the fact that he sent me back was disappointing. What did he say to you? Those words, you have to go back, and which is, uh, there was a lot of feelings involved, a lot of uh, feelings that you feel and not necessarily spoken, although he did speak those words to me. When he did, he turned from me to leave, and I turned from him to leave, and at that moment is when I Welcome. opened my eyes Aww. in in the uh, in the hospital. In the operating, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> very powerful, very powerful, very profound. Now I'm going to ask you a, 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 a silly question. <laughs> Did this change your life? Oh my God! Yeah, the uh, I would say, although I didn't, ha I never had a, a sense of time when I was there. Mm -hmm. Could have been seconds, could have been minutes. No sense of time. So it, it's hard for me to determine how long. Yeah, you know, unless I were to go and check and see how long was I comatose, and maybe mm -hmm. maybe try to determine that way. Um, but you lost con when you hit that planter. You lost consciousness. Oh, I was yeah, I was gone. Believe me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the the extent of the, I, I I won't get into the extent of the injuries yeah. here, uh, but they're described complete fairly completely in the book, uh, listed out. I have documentation for all of it. Mm -hmm. um, I had access to OR reports and things like that because of family members that are doctors and, and so forth. So um, they're fairly comfortable knowing why I was there, uh, not that it was anesthesia induced or opiate induced. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm comfortable with that. Now when you were airlifted to the States, what hospital did you go to then? Uh, I wound up at Good Samaritan Hospital in West Islip. Okay. Uh, as I said, my twin brother's a doctor, my uncle's a doctor, another cousin doc. Uh, they were able to put together a team uh, that I needed to rebuild my face. And how many operations? It, they did it in one. All right. That's, that's uh, it was good. extensive. The work that they did was extensive for, for one surgery. It was six hours or so, six or seven hours of surgery. And uh, they were able to put that team together and uh, what I call in the book, fix me. And, uh, now, did you have a further experience when you had that surgery? No. Okay, it was no. just that one. That was just the old painful and yeah, you know, get me out of the hospital type thing. Yeah. yeah. Just a typical, typical injury. So, what inspired you? Why did you write the book? Why did and and tell us about the title, "A Flight Without Wings." Why why that title? Well, the, you know, after much thought. It, the, the, the title "Flight Without Wings" was um, had a double meaning. You know, the flight without wings. Obviously, you know, it, it, 
it indicates a trip someplace without benefit of you know wings mm -hmm. or engines or you know. uh, but for me um, it it was a throwback to my preconceived notions of what heaven would appear to be uh, and after having experienced it or what what I believe it was for my own belief that's that's what I believe I was um, I didn't see those things I didn't I didn't get that that vision that I had in my head. Mm -hmm. I didn't get that while I was there. I didn't see any wings. I didn't see any halos. Well, no angels. My huh? father, you know, no angels, no unicorns, no, uh, none of those preconceived Saint notions. St. Peter wasn't there. I didn't see St. Peter. <laughs> I didn't even see the pearly gates. And I, I don't know, and I'm not professing to know whether I was, um, you know, online you know, to get in, uh, or or whatever, and you know, Linda, I'm not I'm not even, you know, uh, indicating that it's everyone else's conception of heaven either. Maybe it's a state of mind. Maybe we our consciousness exists afterwards. I I don't know. Maybe it maybe it has a zip code. I I don't. I really don't know, and yeah. I'm not professing to know. All I'm saying is in my book is that. This is what I saw. This is what I felt. What it really is, or or, or whatever, is is uh, is debatable. So, what is your message in the book? What what in relating this experience? What are you trying to tell people? I think the biggest thing that I'm trying to tell people uh, is the same big thing that the experience was for me. And that is that it, what, the experience itself was not the whole story. The biggest part of the story for me uh, came afterwards and, I'm, and is still coming. Okay. In other words, I, I experienced certain things. They, they changed my life. They changed my outlook. Uh, they changed the way I relate to other people, uh, the way I accept it, how I would recognize opportunity a lot of different things and a lot of things have happened in the 20 years since this happened to me um, that I feel is proof of that. Uh, someone may argue that but... Um, can you give us an example? Uh, yeah, I can give you, I'll give you an example that's in the book and um, it, the lack of fear from the peace that I got, the feeling of peace that I got also eliminated the fear of death. Mm -hmm. okay? which also, and also eliminated my fear of a lot of things. So I, um, I was able to approach things, still able to approach things uh, from a little different perspective than I did before, without fear. <laughs> so um, I had a business, uh, it happened to be commercial painting, one of the businesses, and um, uh, the, one of my clients indicated how much money he spent on signage, and. So forth and so on. I'll make this very quick. Um, I said, well, I could do that. Not a problem. So I, I just went to the guy that was the representative of the company that I dealt, dealt with. And I said, listen, anytime you want to save yourself 15% uh, on your bottom line, let me know. I'll do them for you. Oh, you do that? Oh, of course. Hadn't a clue. I didn't have a clue how to do them. <laughs> Not a clue. And this is honest to God. So that lack of fear allowed me to open that door of opportunity. And it, believe me, it's been hugely successful. And it was really just a matter of you know, ultimately recognizing an opportunity that presented itself and, and letting it in. Well, we were talking before the show about the fear factor. Right. And we were really discussing the whole concept of how many people uh, poo-poo these out-of-body, uh, near-death experiences, whatever, as some phenomenon of uh, brain trauma. Um, and, and some people are adamantly opposed to even accepting this. Some people are open to it. Um, some people embrace it. And, and what I found, because I'm getting on in years now, <laughs> I talk to people a lot is that fear stands in the way of a lot of joy. It certainly does. 
and a lot of a lot of being able to embrace what is out there in life. And I'm glad you said um, the thing that inspires me most is that you lost your fear of death. Yeah. And I'm hearing this message from so many different places about, you know, death is like a transition. There's something after this. It's, um, there's another life out there. There's a whole other existence. And my background is science. And my background in science, I love to read about what the astrophysicists are doing. Now, not that I understand half of it, but there's this thing called string theory, which indicates that there are a whole lot more dimensions than we ever thought about. Right. And so what's happening is science is become, becoming more in tune with all of these experiences people are, are saying. And don't you find that if so many people are talking about this, it just can't be like some random thing? Yeah, uh, I do. Um, you have a background in forensics or something, don't you? Yeah, yeah, I taught forensic uh, science. Yeah, um, you know, it's very hard to, to uh, prove something like this that happened to me, you know, metaphysically or, or some quantum physics. It's very hard to, to offer proof for that. But um, I feel that, uh, you know, science and, and religion or spirituality, spirituality coexist. Me too. And I happen <laughs> to think my own opinion is, is that they overlap in many places. And that gray area that's formed from their overlap is where most of us define our belief systems. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I've had doctors, even ones that tried to put me back together, stand there and, and were unable to explain to me why I was still alive. The neurosurgeon could not explain to me, looking at my MRI and looking at me standing in front of him, was at a loss to explain how I could still be alive. Because your, dra your brain damage was so the, extensive? Well, no, no brain involvement, uh, but the breakage of bones, a blowout fracture of the eye orbit, mm -hmm. uh, which sh shattered bones throughout, normally or under other conditions maybe, um, that would have pierced the brain, caused involvement, brain bleed, hemorrhage. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So he could not explain it medically anyway. So for me, for me it was a good validation because, um, and, you know, we all accept that. We all say, okay, uh, we're willing to accept the fact that he can't explain it. He said sometimes tissue responds Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes miracles happen. And sometimes people call it a medical miracle. Mm -hmm. And we seem to accept that. It's an unexplained event. So well, if it happens. Hopefully, hopefully <laughs> um, other unexplained events will be, um, have more powerful messages for people going forward. Have you, have you like, talked to any, anybody else who's have, had these kinds of experiences? Uh, one other on, but very briefly, mm -hmm. uh, it was just a, almost a mention in passing. I, I just did never really wanted to put any thoughts into my head from someone else's experience that that may color. That might change what you. Might change it. You know, yeah. someplace someone that got, you know, filed in the back of my mind someplace, and and came out not as being a hundred percent my recollection of it or my experience with it. And uh, I was adamant about it being strictly my words. But I mean, these 20,000 words in this book is a very short book. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, can, I could show you the manuscript, the original manuscript that I typed out, and it's very close to the same 20,000 words that are here in the book. So as I recalled it, I, I wrote it down, and that's how it's presented. But since it's been... But since it's been published, um, I mean, now that you've gotten your story out the way you wanted to, have you uh, gotten in, have other people sought you out? Uh, a few have asked. Mm -hmm. uh, a few have taken the time to write reviews, as as you may have seen a few. Um, but I don't know. They, many people seem to retreat. Right? And I kept this story to myself for 21 years. A long time. That is a long time. And up until the time that I spoke to the 
neuropsychologist who is quoted on the front of the book, I would have kept it to myself for another 21 years, quite honestly. Mm -hmm. um, he indicated that people would be happy to hear the story, to learn, to, you know, get something out of it. So uh, he kind of convinced me to write the book, and that's why I gave him credit for that on the front of the book, having done that. And, and has, has writing the book, the process of writing the book, changed your perspective of this experience? No, it hasn't changed my perspective of the experience. It has changed my perspective of the process. <laughs> the process of writing? <laughs> <laughs> We're both laughing. When I, first, <laughs> when I first approached this whole thought, I thought, uh, number one, who would want to hear about my life? Well, that's that's what I was went through. Who who would be interested in hearing about? You know? uh, and after that, I thought, oh, sitting down and writing enough words for a book, oh, that's going to be tough. Daunting. <laughs> well, I actually sat down on. 9-11, which was the anniversary of my accident. It happened uh, on 9-11, 94. <laughs> and on that, on that day, on that anniversary, I sat down and wrote half this book in one sitting. It, it, it just all came flowing out mm -hmm, of me. Mm -hmm. um, Before we get into the whole thing about writing, publishing, and marketing, let me read a review. Okay. okay? A fascinating read that is both inspired and inspiring a Flight Without Wings, My Experience with Heaven, will prove to be an enduringly valued addition to personal and community library metaphysical studies reference collections and supplemental studies reading lists. It should be noted that A Flight Without Wings, My Experience with Heaven, is also available, you know, obviously. I know, I know what review that is. Is that the Midwest Book Review? Uh, that came from the Midwest it does, Book It review. probably says it here uh, somewhere. It's a but fairly well-known... Uh, but I mean, the fact yeah. that it's being included where people study these phenomenon, that's pretty impressive. Yeah, uh, yeah. I guess you would say I'm impressed with that. Yeah. Uh, also very satisfying Yeah. that um, those the, the, the different avenues uh, have been able to gather something from it. Those people that study, you know, metaphysical studies and some people who study religion or spirituality uh, all the different all the different avenues seem to be getting something out of it. Well, it's very satisfying to me. The only experience that personal experience I have with this, and it's not me. Um, my first husband was in a terrible automobile accident, head-on collision. He was in a Volkswagen. The other person was in a a, um, a nineteen sixty Chevy. Okay, so <laughs> not a fair fight. And uh, he described. He said, "I could see the accident from above. I saw myself." in the car, I saw my leg trapped in the car, and then I was on the ground. So that's not the same common, kind of thing, yeah. yeah it's not just common. Yeah. Maybe you hear that oftentimes mm -hmm. with anyone who experiences something like this, is uh, some separation of their soul, if you will, yeah. uh, from the body, yeah. and um, looking at it from a different angle, different perspective. <laughs> I, I have a sense of a weird sense of humor, and I, I keep thinking of the fact that, well, if you get hit hard enough, your soul would be knocked out of your body, and then what do you do? <laughs> you know, so. Come back here. <laughs> so, so um, you self-publish? Uh, well, it, it was somewhere in between self-publishing and traditional publishing. Yeah, tell it, us it's about that. A, uh, it's, it's, a, uh, it's, it's not self-published as such. Uh, it, but it's a print-on-demand. Mm -hmm. So although you, you wind up paying fees for certain organizations, certain uh, artwork and composition and, and so forth, uh, you know, you're not having to pay a traditional publisher to print thousands and thousands of books or to commit to that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I mean, obviously, you still pay a fee for whatever you have done in writing. Oh, yeah. So, oh, yeah. There's a fee for everything. Uh, but you don't have to, as I said, you don't have to find someone who's willing to uh, put the money up for thousands of copies to be printed. Right. And, and I don't know, possibly uh, sit someplace until the book is marketed or 
so right. forth, enough to use up those copies. So these, no. these are printed on demand. Right. Now, do you have a Facebook page? I have a Facebook page under, under my name, Brian McLaughlin. Right, and, uh, and, and you have a website. And on Twitter, I'm on uh, at VAM Playa. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have a website that has all of that information on it. Okay. And, uh, one can find places to purchase the book or information about me or even a snippet of the, of the book itself to, to read. And um, they can take it from there. Yeah, that's yeah. that's the best the we can do, one. right? So, because you had this <clears throat> incredible experience and you wrote about it, what would you say to uh, what? What's your best advice to a writer? Because you uh, obviously were not a writer, neither was I no. when I started. And no. what would you tell a writer to Don't help them on the on the journey? Well, I I would I would first uh, suggest that they do the same thing I did, and, and that is to gather whatever information they can. <coughs> and there's plenty available on the internet. Um, talk to other writers. I went and saw you at a, at a writer's group, mm -hmm. gathered information, and, and, and used it going forward. You, you, you know, you put it all together and, and you use it. I think you find that um, if you do your homework, you do due diligence with the information, you can find people willing to help at a reasonable price and uh, not take advantage of you or of your naivete. And you can accomplish what you want to accomplish. Just persevere. Perseverance. That's what everyone says. Yeah. Well, it's a, an amazing story, and I wish you the best Thank of you. luck getting it out. And I know that you're going to meet uh, some very interesting people <laughs> in <Yes>. the future. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Linda. Great to see you. Great. Again.